Hello and welcome to our session today on Foundational AI, A Mathematician's Take, which was originally presented at COGEX 2020. I'm delighted to introduce Benjamin Gage, who is a Principal Research Fellow in Machine Learning at University College London and Scientific Director of the INRIA London programme. Benjamin will be presenting Foundational AI, A Mathematician's Take, and will be discussing how AI's impressive successes have made it pervasive in society and caught the interest of industry and decision makers, although little is acknowledged in the public eye to the essential theoretical foundations of AI systems. Benjamin will present examples of how theoreticians' contributions are a key fuel to AI and comment on future exciting challenges. Thanks very much, Benjamin, and over to you. Thanks very much, Mark, and hello to everyone. I'm delighted to present this talk, uh, my personal take on what foundational AI is and what remains to be done in the very exciting years we have ahead. So let's start with maybe a, small, a few words uh, towards artificial general intelligence or AGI as it's called, um, as a prelude. So um, what AGI is about is the quest for artif uh, an artificial entity which is capable of interacting and coexisting with us human and, and more globally with the environment. So this includes uh, those particular tasks. Again, this is my own personal take. There's many more that you could uh, list on, on, on these ones. Um, but the way I see it, there's the need to comply to instructions, whether they would be oral or written or visual. So that needs this entity to be able to interpret what we do mean and, and the underlying explanations uh, that a lot get uh, omitted really when we interact between humans. Initiate new decisions depending on the current state of the environment. On the environment. Um, there's also a striving force towards explainability in AI, in particular the need to be able to explain why a particular AI system has made the decisions which must be based on a rationale that could be explained as far as we could. Uh, compliance to a set of rules, um, so um, I've been listing morals, law, uh, and so on. So for example, you can imagine that those set of rules, overarching rules in society is very likely to evolve over time, and this must be acknowledged as well, and so on and so on. So acknowledging the environment and the interactions with humans is, is absolutely essential in that quest to an artificial general intelligence entity. Um, I should also stress that AGI could be embedded in physical agents, so quite easily and straightforwardly we do think about robots or autonomous vehicles, for example. But it could also just be an entity which is uh, interfaced through computers, for example, or smartphones for that matter. And this is actually the way most of us in, do interact with AI systems uh, nowadays. You, you speak to your phone, um, you have uh, interactions with tablets and computers towards digital systems. And this is the most of what, what people see about AI. The point is, this can be hard programs. Obviously, there's the combinatorics of those situations that must be accounted for actually requires that this entity must be able to adapt and must be able to learn from previous situations and previous tasks and previous data sets and situations. So, there's this quest for adaptability, and, and this is where actually machine learning kicks in. So this is obviously a very multidisciplinary effort, and there's a lot of fields involved in AGI. I don't have the, the pretension to be listing all of those, actually on those slides, I'm just listing the most obvious, at least to me. Um, in particular, the first row is the one I'm, I'm more interested in. So statistics, machine learning, probability theory, and optimization are all the key topics um, that I've been working on for, for the past few years, and this is what I will be commenting on in the rest of that presentation. But AI uh, obviously requires also a lot of research and efforts from neuroscience, uh, psychology, robotics as well, uh, and so on and so on. So um, um, I'd like to stress here that this effort really requires coordination of many, many disciplines with possibly many different topics and many different languages. So that's what also makes it so fascinating. It's, it's really a way of driving a, a very large effort within the scientific community. And that, that's what makes it really fantastic. And among the many tasks uh, that are addressed by statistics and machine learning, uh, probability theory, mostly interested in the learning and decision-making module. So that's the one I will be commanding on mostly. And this module basically says that when you do collect data, when you do try to solve some tasks, 
uh, you actually acquire more knowledge. You acquire more raw data from which you extract maybe some patterns. And that involves uh, and, and that influences the decision making process. So you have this constant interplay between collection of data, collection of tasks, and, and experiments really with the world. And then this fuels the decision making process. The environment gives you some kind of feedback, a reward, or maybe something negative to, to influence your behavior afterwards. And then you loop over it again. Um, and the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is that it's over connected. Um, so I'm, I'm a theoretician by training, um, and most of my research is theoretical. But I do acknowledge that this theory is pretty useless if you don't take into account the constraints, for example, of algorithms and, and how they can be implemented and how they can be stored, for example, on digital systems um, or the computational constraints that you could be facing. It's not the same thing to design a machine learning system for a smartphone and, and another one for a large company with dozens of servers. Um, you should also acknowledge the, the constraints that practitioners of machine learning are facing. You should acknowledge, in particular, um, for example, ethical uh, constraints and eth ethical considerations about the deployment of your systems. And all in all, this interplay is all connected to the way we do interact with what I call the sensible world, which is the entity providing you with data. You, you can't do much without data in machine learning. And, and the processes that actually do generate this data are very mysterious. And I don't think there's a serious hope to understand at all what's going on in most situations, but we have to make the most of it and acknowledge the limitations and constraints in those settings. So it, it's all very connected. And I certainly don't uh, adhere to that idea that theoreticians can stay in their ivory tower and just ignore what's going on. I'm very much keen to, to contribute in bridging that gap. Right, so, so I would say that the big picture here is that since we do need this coordinated and, and multidisciplinary research efforts, there's a question which is legitimate on the place where mathematicians and computer scientists do fit in. So I'm affiliated with UCL and INRIA, both are extremely renowned institutions for mathematicians and computer scientists in particular, but it's, it's still a bit of a struggle uh, to try and understand where do mathematicians and computer scientists fit in that picture. And the way I see it, uh, again, that's my personal take, that we, we can contribute as theoreticians, we, we can and should contribute to understanding and designing systems in artificial, in, in artificial intelligence uh, and, and try to provide a better understanding of what's at stake on the theoretical side. My personal research obsession is about generalization, so I'll comment on that in, in a minute. Um, but the whole idea of trying to predict the performance of future artificial intelligence system is what's driven me in the past decade. One of my personal claim, and not just mine, uh, I think a large part of the machine learning community shares that, is that learning is actually not more than be able to generalize. What is generalization? Uh, so this is a very classical picture. Uh, this one's taken from Wikipedia. And this illustrates that if you want to be able to learn some particular phenomenon, it's not enough, obviously, to learn by heart what has happened in the past, to absolutely mimic all the data you've collected. And generalization is concerned about that particular question. From examples, so the dots that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, what can the system learn about an underlying phenomenon, which is the uh, black solid line? On that picture and if you do memorize what you've already collected you you would actually be prone to a phenomenon which is called overfitting and and that's really something which should be avoid, uh, avoided sorry in, in machine learning systems uh, take another example if you do take a test uh, at school and you've learned by heart all the answers to all previous tests from the past 20 years if any of those questions comes up again in, in that particular test you do fantastic right you will have fantastic grade. But if the test is brand new and none of the questions uh, have been seen in the past, then you will have an awful note. And that's because you've been memorizing what you've seen without understanding what was at stake and how, how you could generalize to future and, and other questions. So this part uh, of my talk is actually borrowed to the, the ICML 2019 tutorial that I gave with John Taylor. Um, 
uh, in, in June. So, so you can access the slides and videos uh, following this link. So let me put this in mathematical phrasing. The simplest setting is the following. We do have a learning algorithms, which I will call A. And A is just a machine to which you give some data and it outputs what we call a hypothesis. So the hypothesis class is called H. And a hypothesis is simply a function. And when you give to that function an input, X, it gives you something which hopefully is not too far from the output, Y. And that's what uh, the statistical machine learning formalization is about. You're trying to understand how you could derive the best H, the best function that will mimic the underlying phenomenon that you're trying to, to understand and predict. Um, we, we're going to make a few simplifying assumptions. Again, those assumptions can be lifted. Uh, there's a lot of effort in literature to do so. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to go with the simplest assumptions over here. Uh, so I'm just going to assume that the uh, data generating distribution, which are called P, um, actually serves to generate a sample of points. And those points are what we call IEDs, so uh, independent and identically distributed. So they all follow the same distribution, which is known. And the goal is to try and, and do uh, the, the, the best we could, really. We're trying to do as good, almost, as if we knew the unknown distribution. What's generalization in mathematical phrasing? When I said earlier then H is a function to which you give an input X and you, you hope that it will be a good approximation of the output Y. Well, if you try and, and make this more uh, rigorous, uh, we do use what we call a loss function, which is simply a measure of discrepancy between H of X and Y, the output um, that, you, that you will observe later on. And this loss function obviously is still random variables. We need to take the average of those values to try and make a measure which is understandable and which you can compare. So that gives what we call the risk. There's the theoretical risk, which is the expectation of that random variable with respect to the unknown data generating distribution. And since it's unknown, obviously, you can't compute that expectation. So we have this empirical counterpart, the empirical risk. I will call this in the rest of the talk the out of sample risk or R out and the in sample risk or R in. So this you can compute easily on your data set. Uh, and this one is the quantity you're trying to, to infer. And so the question asked by generalization, if, if I do have a predictor, if I do have a function H which does well on the particular data set that I have, will it still do well on a different data set? If I have a new data set coming in, uh, What's the performance of my algorithm or, or my predictor? So for that, we study what we call the generalization gap, this delta quantity, which is simply the difference between R out and R in. And I'm especially interested in upper bounds on that quantity. So with very high probability, actually arbitrarily high probability, we'll be interested in upper bounding that quantity by a term epsilon m delta, which will depend so mostly on the sample size m and also on a confidence threshold delta. Uh, I'll comment on this in the next few slides. There's a lot of flavors for this kind of results. And the most salient ones are either distribution free or distribution dependent. Does this depend on the particular distribution that you put on either data or predictors? And also algorithm free or algorithm dependent is this upper bound specific to a particular algorithm or does it hold for larger class and wider classes of, of algorithms? Among the, the many frameworks that have been derived to try and understand the, these kind of bounds and these kind of results, the one I'm particularly interested in called uh, the PAC framework. So PAC stands for probably approximately correct. You understand why on this slide. And this uh, may be traced back to Valiant in the 80s. So roughly translated, what PAC means, what PAC inequality means, is that with high probability, so that's the meaning of uh, that part in red, with a probability which is arbitrarily close to one, the error of one particular hypothesis, that is the particular error you're going to commit if you pick that one hypothesis, is upabunded by the error you commit on the particular data set that you have, plus a term which is in most cases explicit. So you can actually control what is the price to pay to learn on a particular data set and hope that you will perform well on a different one. So that term, uh, 
is is um, is responsible for the approximately correct part in the acronym. So that's what you have to pay to to have these kind of guarantees. And to make things clearer, maybe you can think of this term as a measure of complexity. Uh, so if you're familiar with it, this could be connected to Vevnik Shabonenke's dimension, uh, Rademacher complexity, or, or probability divergent, which has a callback Leibler between two probability distributions. Uh, this will be uh, the case in a few bounds that we'll comment on uh, later on. But this is mostly a measure of complexity of the problem you're looking at. Times a term which is basically, and in most settings, one of a square root of how many points you have times uh, the dependence on the confidence threshold. So you could see that if you want to have an absolute confidence, if you want delta to be as close as zero as possible, then this term will start to emerge. So you will degrade the bound in a sense, and you will have something which we call vacuous. That is, if you're about to upper bound this quantity by something which is super large, then this will hold with probability virtually one. That's not very informative. So there's a constant trade-off in those inequalities, and you're interested in, in having something which is as tight as possible on the right-hand side of that inequality, holding with a reasonable probability. So you're willing to trade off some of that probability, some of that confidence probability, to have something which is tighter. If you have a bound which is more meaningful, only holding with probability 99% or even 95%, uh, that's the kind of trade-off you, you would be willing to do, typically. There's a very rich literature on those bounds, and in particular, there's a subcategory of those back bounds, which is called back base. Um, and if, you, if you're interested in that, you're very welcome to have a look at this recent survey uh, that I've written last year. It also serves as a backbone to the ICM in 2019 tutorial I was mentioning earlier. Right, so why is it interesting uh, for people who are not interested in theoretical results in machine learning? Well, my claim is that this still serves as a safety check and, and should serve as a safety check uh, for actually most practitioners in machine learning. Generalization bounds will give you a theoretical guarantee on the performance of learning algorithms on any new future data. Let me explain. If you have a result such as this one, this term, the R out of H, is the error you're gonna commit on any particular data set, which is sample from the same and probability. So what we're saying with this kind of inequalities is that if you're able to evaluate the performance of your particular algorithm on the one data set that you have collected, and if you compute this bound, for example, you will have a precise control, a precise upper bound on the worst error you're gonna commit on any future data set that you might collect in the future. And this is why we call those generalization bounds, actually. This gives you a formal guarantee on your generalization ability. This is what's gonna happen. When you collect new data in a week, a year, or 10 years from now, this is what's gonna happen at worst. So in that sense, it really is a safety check. And you do get this computable control on the error on any unseen data. Uh, it could also explain why specific learning algorithms actually work. If you're able to compute that particular band for one algorithm and say, hey, the accuracy uh, so, sorry, the, the, the worst error I'm going to suffer with that particular algorithm is 0.1, for example. This gives you a precise uh, guarantee that this particular algorithm will work because you will never have an error which is larger than 10%, for example. Uh, the last claim, uh, not the least, is that it could lead to designing new algorithms. So in this particular bound, uh, you could remark that H is left unspecified, in particular if this holds for any H, this gives you a very uh, elegant and principled way of deriving new algorithms. But you do that, well, you simply minimize the right-hand side of that bound with respect to H. And this gives you an H star, in a way, which is the hypothesis which minimizes the right-hand side of, of, of the bound. I was saying earlier that you're interested in having this term as small as possible. Well, if you do that, you're basically ensuring that for this particular H star you're gonna build, then this bound is as tight as it could be. And that's that's kind of a good growl in, in machine learning and statistical machine learning. Right, um, let's move on now to, to one particular recent interest in the literature and, and the machine learning community. Um, there's been a lot of results on, on deep learning. So deep learning 
is actually kind of an old ID. Uh, it can be traced back to, to the 50s, uh, surprisingly to, to some people maybe. Um, but this ID, which is, which is you no, know, I think fairly well understood, uh, was not implemented for a long time because it required computational powers, for example, that we didn't have until very recently. There's this dark age or, or winter age of deep learning uh, in the 70s and 80s. And the resurgence of deep learning in the early 2000 and 2010 is due to the breaking of that computational power uh, ceiling. So, so we were now able to, to compute large architectures, to implement large architectures, and we now have the, the power to use those algorithms. Um, but there's been, a, I would not say a lack of interest, but, but there was definitely a lot of theoretical results missing for deep learning because it was not implemented for a long time. So there was not so much research effort uh, in that direction. More recently, there's been a lot of empirical studies on, on deep neural networks architectures uh, and the fantastic empirical successes of deep learning have actually questioned the validity, the, the core validity of statistical learning theory. We could not understand what was happening. So to give you an example, most of the neural networks architectures that you train now on massive data sets, if you think of ImageNet or, or any other particular data set you're interested in, most architectures will actually achieve almost zero training loss, right? So you would do fantastically on the data sets that you have because we, we now have the, the power and infrastructures to train those networks uh, for millions and billions of epochs. And if you do achieve a training error, if you're a statistician or, or follow the very first slides of this talk, you, this would raise an alarm, right? If you achieve a training error, which is zero, then you're very likely to be prone to overfitting. And we've seen that overfitting is bad. If you do memorize perfectly the data set, then it doesn't bode very well for your generalization abilities. What's super surprising is that a lot of deep neural networks architectures do achieve training error, almost zero, but they do also have fantastically low errors on test sets. So this, this hints in some ways that the generalization is actually not that bad, not as bad as we could have feared. Um, so this is a very famous plot, uh, which is borrowed from a, an excellent paper from Belkin and co-authors. Uh, this plot is, is Statistics 101, I should say, or Machine Learning 101. Uh, it, rep it represents the risk. Uh, so remember the theoretical risk I was, I was introducing earlier uh, in, with respect to the complexity of the class of hypotheses. So it's, it's well understood uh, in, in the statistical and machine learning communities that as you increase the complexity of H, uh, you, you have more and more complex uh, systems, you have more and more expressive um, predictors, for example, uh, the better you should be able to understand the training set. So if you do increase this complexity of H, there will come a time where your training error will be basically zero because you have achieved so much ex expressiveness power uh, that you could replicate any underlying function and so you would be able to predict almost perfectly. So this dotted line is the training risk and the solid line is the test risk. And what was uh, also very well understood and thought of in those communities is that as you increase complexity of age, this dotted line goes to zero. But after a certain point, the test risk actually goes up again. It starts decreasing and then it goes up again. Why is that? Because of overfitting, right? So you're underfitting until that point, and then over here you you basically understand what's going on in the data set. But if you keep increasing, if you keep increasing the complexity of H, you will just memorize the training set, and you will do very poorly on the test sets. So the quest in statistical machine learning has always been for that sweet spot over here, the optimal trade-off between the complexity and optimizing the training and test risk. It's it's kind of a bias and variance trade-off uh, in in a sense. So this plot, which is extremely famous, actually might just be half of the picture. That's the conjecture of Belkin and, and co-authors in their paper last year. So that, that's what the other half could be. Uh, so they, they propose this new interpretation rather than uh, underfitting and overfitting. They, they call those two regimes underparameterized and overparameterized. So what's happening is you have that classical sweet spot over here. And then as you keep increasing the complexity of H, the training risk 
still is zero, but the test rate actually goes up and up and up and up until a certain point. So you reach kind of a plateau over here. And then surprisingly, the test rate starts decreasing again. And this is the what they call the interpolating regime. And this interpolation threshold might very well be an explanation why deep neural networks are actually able to have good generalization abilities. So this has been at the core of many research efforts in the past few years, uh, including in our group at the AI Center, obviously. Uh, and, and this will remain, I'm pretty sure, a very hot topic in the next few years. Let me uh, give you another example uh, of recent advances in machine learning. This is called uh, the jigsaw problem. And, and I would like to use this to support a claim that representation actually matter. In this kind of plot, you could get the impression that all this is about, all what machine learning is about is just accumulating more and more complexity and more and more data and more and more brute force uh, understanding of the world. Well, I would like to, to modulate that um, because I do not believe that the future of AI and machine learning is in accumulating more and more brute force uh, and, and billions and billions of data and gigabytes of, of data on any possible phenomenon. There's something more subtle and, and more clever to, to be done. And this is where representation kick in. So this is an example, uh, so this is taken from a very famous paper also from Naruzi and Favaro in 2016. Um, and on the left, you have an image of a car. Uh, if, you, if you cut that image and, and try to solve the jigsaw problem, which is associated to one particular image, if you have a computer and enough computing power, Eventually, you will solve the jigsaw problem. It's just a combinatorial problem. You can use all pieces. You just put one piece, and then you test all other pieces, all remaining pieces. Even if you had millions or even billion pieces, you could still do this, right? It's just a matter of time and computational power. But if you do know that the image represents a car, well, the combinatorics act is actually much smaller. You know that next to a door, for example, comes another door, right? You cannot put a wheel. Uh, above another one, and so on and so on. So we have this internal structure, internal representation, which is at work. And, and this seems extremely uh, natural for us human. It definitely is not for a machine. So this is one particular example where representation of the world actually matter to drastically accelerate the learning. Uh, as humans, we certainly don't need billions and billions of data to understand this kind of problem. With just a handful of data points, we are able to solve a lot of complex tasks, whereas computers need millions and millions of annotated data. So yeah, that, that's, that's my take on why representations are actually a key topic in contemporary machine learning. I'd like to, to stress that uh, a bit more with this tale of two learners. So that's learner number one, a deep neural network, very classical, so we have this input layer, the output layer and in between you have a certain number of hidden layers. Could be massive if you're a big company, could be smaller if, if you're a research, uh, if you're a researcher in a, in a public institution, but no matter what, the architecture stays the same. So you have this deep neural network, which typically achieves fantastic results in simple tasks. So for example, identifying an item in an image, say a horse, you, know, you, you provide this neural network with images of horses, uh, annotated images of horses, then you train your network, and after enough epochs, which is doable, for example, on a, on a personal laptop nowadays, you will achieve an accuracy which is virtually 100%. You will be able to perfectly identify horses in images. But this requires a very expensive training. I mean, not taking into account, obviously, the research and infrastructures efforts uh, in, in, the past two, in the past few years for, for development. Uh, you will still need millions of annotated images of horses to achieve a good accuracy. So this is expensive. It's GPU expensive training in a sense. And, and certainly this is not what happens in nature. Right, so that's learner number one. Here's learner number two, um, my own daughter, who's also very interested in, in identifying horses in images and books, for example. In, I mean, surprisingly, the accuracy is not much different between a machine and a human, right? I mean, she would still identify horses with 100% accuracy, almost 100%, uh, but let's say 100%. The training samples are very different. 
right? Um, it's it's just a handful of children books, um, a few bedtime stories, some drawings, sometimes poorly executed from me, uh, I'm afraid. But the point is, you still need an amount of data which is not even comparable to the, the deluge of data you will need to train a similar neural network on the same tasks. Um, obviously, this is still an expensive training, but for different reasons. So back to my original claim, learning is to be able to generalize. Yes, but not from scratch, certainly not from scratch. You need to acknowledge something profound and subtle, which is the internal representation. And we could certainly not hope to solve uh, artificial general intelligence if we try and solve each learning task as a fresh draw. We must not be blind to the context and the representation uh, and, and previous experience. So that's my, my claim uh, on that. And I'm, I'm very much working towards, uh, with, with my group here at UCL and, and with a lot of projects involving collaborations in different countries, in particular the US, we, we strive really to develop this incorporation of structural semantic information. We need to include the implicit representation of the sensible world, what I call the sensible world earlier on on the slides, into the learning process. And, and by that, I mean that we need to, to acknowledge this in the mathematical formulation. So that's the next frontier, I would say, for, for us theoreticians. This potentially would be a game changer, really, for algorithm design. Because if we move towards more intelligence in the sense of more human intelligent uh, algorithms, this could mean more resource efficient, data efficient uh, algorithms, which would mimic much more closely what happens with human beings and, and particular humans, um, rather than needing millions or even billions of images of horses. If you could train a, a network with say 100 images, for example, and still achieve the same accuracy, that would be fantastic progress and, and definitely game changer in terms of resources, infrastructure, uh, and also reflecting on the environmental cost of machine learning, which is increasingly uh, increasingly uh, a burden for, for practitioners. Right, so yeah, I hope I've convinced you that it's a very exciting uh, avenue for theoreticians, not just for theoreticians, but in particular for theoreticians for over the next decades. Um, if you'd like to go further, there's the ICML 2019 tutorial I was mentioning earlier uh, that I gave with John Schotella last year. So you can access the slides and, and recording on that link. Uh, I would also recommend a fantastic book from Leslie Valiant. So uh, remember, Valiant is, is responsible for that acronym PAC, probably approximately correct. And he's written this excellent book, um, which was published in 2013. Uh, you can read this as, an, as a novel, really. It's, it's fascinating. Um, and obviously, you're very welcome to connect with the UCL Center for Artificial Intelligence. Um, I should also mention that if you're looking for master programs or in particular PhD programs, um, the, the AI Center at UCL is the home to our UKRI Center for Doctoral Training in Foundational Artificial Intelligence. Um, so you're very welcome to get in touch if you're interested. And um, thank you very much for attending. Feel free to reach out. You can follow me on the following links. And thanks again.